Right, let's go again. Let's go ahead and get started. First of all, thank you so much for uh, coming. I know that some of you, some of you are here on your um, on your own curiosity, and some of you are here uh, just to get extra credit on uh, for a class. But hopefully, that's the reason you came, and you might leave with a new appreciation for. Uh, research and for the neat things that we can do around here uh, with uh, research. You'll see the research that Libby has presented and how it's all tied together with uh, not just the biology and chemistry department, but also as our, our mission as a university. Part of uh, the mission of this university is to, you know, number one has to do with teaching students in an academically challenging uh, way. And one of the major ways that you learn science is to actually do science. And you'll hear that from a number of, uh, pretty much every science class you'll take, that science is something that you have to learn to do, not just learn a bunch of information from books, but the more time you put into learning how to do critical thinking, learning, learning how to solve complicated problems in a research environment, the better you are equipped to handle all sorts of things in life, right? Right? right. All right, right. Uh, the other uh, interesting tie-in is as a Christian university, uh, I, I think it's incredibly appropriate, very impro appropriate for us to study the things that we're looking at today. Uh, Libby, you can read the, uh, the, the title here, but uh, Libby's research is focused on pulling specific molecules uh, out of plants that have chemotherapeutic properties. Uh, a lot of times when we think of um, cancer treatments, chemotherapy, uh, we think of surgeries and, and drugs you can possibly buy at um, uh, hospitals or, or pharmacies, but a huge population of the uh, world, a huge percentage of the population of the world doesn't have that option. So most of the medicine that is used in uh, a large bit of the world is through medicinal plants. And there's been literally thousands of years worth of, of trial and error that have gone into understanding which plants work for what. And the neat thing about what Libby and some other researchers around here are doing is they're finding that these plants that, or these molecules that God put in these plants uh, actually impact some of the same biochemical pathways that a lot of the modern drugs do. So it's neat to see those uh, correlations happening at Christian University studying uh, molecules that we believe God's put into these plants for a reason. Okay, So before we get going, um, like we generally start seminars here with a prayer, let's go ahead and do that. Father, we thank you for uh, Wayland. We thank you for the students and the faculty that teach the classes and uh, just the, the environment that you've created here. Father, we pray that um, you will open our eyes just a little bit into your creation uh, this afternoon and uh, be able to see you even in the smallest of details. Father, again, we, we thank you for, um, for who you are and the work you're doing among us here at Wayland. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. With that, let me introduce Libby Saltz. She is a Welsh scholar. She has uh, collected a stipend for summer research and paid her to work through the summer and Wayland kicked in room and board for her as part of the research program here in the summer. Uh, she has worked since about Christmas last year on this research, and uh, I think you'll agree after you've seen this that she's come a long way and has gotten a lot of, of uh, neat results. She's only going to be able to present a little bit of what she's done. Most of these graphs and figures she has, is going to show you, she's got two or three replicates of, and um, you know, there's a lot more to this story than she's going to be able to present here. But this was work done primarily by Libby and Jarrett Ross. So with that, I'll turn it over to Libby and she'll present her race for the cure. Okay, okay like Dr. Reinhardt said, I had the great opportunity to do research this summer and it was really cool. And this project started several years back at Wayland and it's been going on for a while and we're looking at medicinal herbs and plants and seeing uh, what their effect is if they can kill cancer cells. 
And the picture on the left, these are MCF7 cells. The picture on the left is what cells look like when they're living. Those cells haven't been treated and they're just growing normally. And then the picture on the right, um, it's easier to tell under a microscope because the cells will be like floating around and moving and you can kind of tell they're sort of blurry. But those cells have been treated with ginger and those cells are dead. And that's kind of our ultimate goal here was to kill cancer cells. And um, everything, like Dr. Reinhardt said, Jarrett's my research partner. So everything that uh, I'm presenting, Jarrett had a huge hand in. So I just want to say thanks to Jarrett before I start and give him credit. Okay, so the reason for this research is because breast cancer is a huge like it's having a huge impact. One in eight women will get breast cancer at some point in their life. And two and a half million women and 13,000 men in the United States have breast cancer right now. And so it's a really big deal and something that if we can help out and help in any way towards finding a cure, then that's something we want to do. And uh, like some of the treatment options right now are radiation and chemotherapy and things like that. And so that's why we're looking at plants to be like it's called alternative medicine. Plants fall in the category of biological therapy and it's a lot less harmful to people and so if you could you know use a plant to cure you instead of radiation or something that would be a lot better. And also plants like Dr. Reinhardt said like these plants have been used for thousands of years in places like China and India to cure things like headaches and they're used in teas so these plants are readily available to people like underprivileged people in third world countries and this could be a great way to get treatment options to people who can't have chemotherapy or something like that. Okay, so when I started this research project we were using the 4T1 cell line which is a mouse cancer cell line and it's been good to use because we've actually done studies in the past where we actually treated live mice and dealt with live mice and uh, we, the plant extracts that we used, we did literature research to see that they were COX-2 inhibitors or anti-inflammatory, and we tested these plants on the cells using MTS assays and luminescent assays to determine if they were killing cancer cells. And this summer, a major thing that happened was we identified a lot of problems with MTS assays, so I'll go over that, and that's why we switched to luminescent assays. And we also do apoptosis assays to determine if cells are dying, then what's the mechanism of cell death. And Western blotting is uh, one of our major apoptosis assays. And we switched this year, well not switched, but we're additionally studying the MCF7 cell line, which is a human cell line, so we're excited to see what that will bring about. Okay, so our basic experimental plan is like this. First we make plant extracts. We take powdered plant material and boil it in ethanol, and then we filter it and resuspend it in a solvent in either DMSO or ethanol, and that's what we use. That's what we're putting on the cancer cells and to test the plants. And um, Dr. Gray's, there were three other people who did research this summer, and what they did was based on the research that people here have done in the past and determined what plants are killing cells, they took some plants and further separated them into different components. And so we would take those smaller components and treat the cells with that to determine specifically what component was killing cells. And we also, once we do that, we determine what concentration is best to kill cells. Like um, we wanted to kill not not wiped out completely all the cells and uh, okay then once we determine that we do our apoptosis experiments to determine how the cells are dying. These are some of the extracts that we used and the top three will be you'll see them a lot throughout the presentation because ginger, fenugreek, and turmeric are the plants that Dr. Gray's research team were working with and so we would use those a lot to treat the cells. Okay, so MTS assays work by, we plate cells in a 96 well dish, which is up in the top right hand corner, that's a 96 well dish, and there's cells in those different wells, and we plate the cells in the 96 well plate, 
and then we incubated it for 24 hours and then treated them with our plant extracts and incubated it for another 24 hours and let them grow. And then we would put an MTS solution in the wells and by that reaction, it would turn the MTS would turn to formazin based on how much metabolic activity was going on. So if there was a lot of me metabolic activity, a lot of formazin was being created, and formazin is kind of a purplish color, so the more metabolic activity, the more formazin and the darker the wells would become. And we have a plate reader that measures absorbance. And so the higher up, like if you can see on that axis, the higher up the absorbance is, the more cells were alive, because um, the darker they were. So one of our applications for the MTS assay was to determine what solvents we wanted to use. We had been using DMSO, which is, uh, we weren't sure if we wanted to keep doing that. And so we treated cells with different concentrations of DMSO and did an MTS assay on them. And the results we found were kind of weird. The one to one was the strongest DMSO. and it's a low number, so that's what you would expect, because that means that the strongest concentration of DMSO was killing cells. But then as you get 1 to 10 killed a little fewer cells, and then 1 to 100 and 1 to 1,000 still killed fewer. But when we went to 1 to 10,000 and 1 to 100,000, it looked like more cells were dying again, and that's weird because it was not as great of a concentration, so why would that happen? Um, DMSO, though, is known to do weird things with cell membranes and cell nuclei, and so we were wondering if that would is maybe why we're getting these weird results. Um, this picture is really cool. You can actually see, like, cells die. Like, the cells are, like, kind of, like, spitting out their content and, like, die, so it's kind of cool. Um, so DMSO does kill cells, and we didn't we didn't know exactly our results. We consistently got the hill-shaped graph, and we didn't want to keep using a solvent that might be killing our cells because we wanted to know if our extracts are killing cells, not if our solvent is killing cells. So we tested ethanol as well, and ethanol had a more predictable uh, response. When we were the stronger the eth or the stronger the ethanol concentration, the more cells it killed. The untreated cells are over on the far right, and um, so the untreated cells, that's what you would, like, no cells should be dying, and when you got to small concentrations of ethanol, uh, it really wasn't killing cells very much because they're right in line with the untreated, and so ethanol was a more predictable solvent, and we decided to go with that for the summer. So MTS assays, we used it for our extracts, too, to determine if our extracts were killing cells. And these graphs are of turmeric. They're different fractionated parts of turmeric. Trevor separated turmeric into different components, and that's what all those weird little letters on the bottom mean. They're just the different parts. And you can tell that some of them kill cells and some of them don't, because the lower ones are, the, that's what killed cells. And um, okay, turmeric, though, like, it's in mustard, and it's really yellow. Trevor's hands were yellow all the time. He would wipe it on his pants, and his pants were all yellow. And uh, it would, like, when I would treat the cells with it, it would turn, the cells would turn yellow right away, and it was staining them. And so if turmeric was absorbing around 492, and our MTS assays were measuring absorbance, then that was a problem because the plate reader would be reading the color of the turmeric instead of how much formazin was there. So I ran a control where I didn't put in any MTS solution, so no formazin would be created. So I subtracted out the basically the darkness of the turmeric, and you can see these bands right here go down a lot in, with, when the control is subtracted out. So that made us think that turmeric was actually killing cells a lot better than it looked like originally. So we decided to look at another assay to determine cell cytotoxicity. So we looked at a luminescent assay, which um, 
in, it's basically the same as MTS with a few, like it's different, but it's measuring the same thing. Um, you plate cells in a white walled plate instead, and you still do the same basic treatment thing, except for you incubate a different amount of time when you put in the uh, glow substrate, it's less time. And anyway, luminescent assays measure like the amount of ATP, and so the more living cells, the more ATP, and if cells are dead, then there wouldn't be as much ATP to measure, and so um, that's how luminescent assays worked. And we found that we had, when cells were dead, it was, luminescent assays showed that they were dead, like there was no line. It, I'll show you a graph in just a second, and it was good. And the standard deviation was typically lower, and we were trying to figure out concentrations in the luminescent assays are better for that as well. Okay, see with a thin A and where there's no cells, there's right there and right there. There's no, like it's not going. On the MTS assays, we would, if there was everything was dead, we would have a bar sometimes halfway up the graph, and that was a concern. So luminescent assays definitely show us if cells are dying. We had seen in the past, previous research, that with a ferrin A kills cells, and so that was consistent with what we had already seen. And this assay is of turmeric, and you can see most of the standard deviation bars were smaller, and we were able to see that turmeric and different things were killing cells. We wanted to see what concentrations of our extracts were killing cells, so we decided to find the IC50, which stands for inhibitory concentration 50%, and it's like the amount of a plant extract that kills half of your cells. And so the x-axis shows concentration, so as you go farther to the right on the x-axis, you're gonna have, your, the more concentrated you are, the more cells would be dead, and so the lower you are on the concentration. And so anyways, the IC50 is that point right there, which is killing half of the cells. We ran dose response curves, which just mean that we use different amounts of whatever we were trying to find the IC50 of ginger in this case. We use different concentrations of ginger and treated the cells with it and saw how they reacted to each different concentration. And so for ginger, the strongest one killed the most, and it, it didn't exactly fit a perfect curve, but we were able to come up with IC50 numbers for it, and ginger, killed, ginger had a higher IC50 concentration than bloodroot, because bloodroot killed, strong concentrations of bloodroot killed everything, like cells would be floating, and so it didn't take as much bloodroot to kill everything as it did ginger, so that's a reflection of that. So once we figured out concentrations and decided that cells are dying, we wanted to see why they're dying, and we were hoping that it would be by apoptosis, which is programmed cell death, instead of necrosis, which could be caused by a lot of different environmental factors. And so one way to determine that was there's a lot of caspase activity when apoptosis is happening, and caspase will be cleaved if apoptosis is happening. So we wanted to examine that using uh, caspase assays and western blots, which western blots actually show us if caspase is cleaved, so that's really cool. And here's a caspase assay that we did. We really only had um, a little, we had like half a bottle of this caspase stuff and it was really expensive so we didn't order more but this graph is reason for us to order more in the future because uh, we got pretty good results. Um, ethanol, like you should look right there and everything above there probably has, it looks like it has caspase activity. Um, so that's what with a ferrin A doesn't, and we had previous studies had shown that with a ferrin A typically doesn't have, doesn't cause caspase activity. We think with a ferrin A causes cells to die by necrosis. So um, 
anyways, these are the extracts that we were testing these sum this summer, and they all seem like they might have caspase activity. So we were excited about that. And Western blotting is another way to determine caspase activity. And we start out the same way as the other MTS assays and luminescent assays. We would plate cells, and then we would treat them with plant extracts. And then we did a protein extraction where we took out the protein or extracted protein from the cells that had been treated to see what proteins were there. And we would take the protein extractions and run them down a gel. And so the proteins would be separated by size on the gel. And then we took the gel and blotted it to a membrane, which the membrane could then be probed with antibodies and we could look for specific proteins depending on what antibody we were using. Okay, so this is what a Western blot looks like, and this is one of the recent ones we did that we're excited about. Um, there are different lanes. You can see, like, okay, this is a lane, this is a lane, this is a lane, and each lane is of a different protein extraction, and I marked... Um, what the cells were treated with. The, this one, ginger 30, was treated with a really high concentration of ginger, and the IC50 was treated with the concentration we came up with that was killing half the cells. And um, this marker shows what the weight of the proteins are in kilodaltons, so we can look, and at 34 kilodaltons, this is caspase showing up, and at 17 kilodaltons, this is where caspase was cleaved. We were excited that the ginger, blood root, turmeric band 2, and ashwagandha band 6 all seem to have um, an active caspase 3 enzyme because it showed up for all of those at 17. So we were excited about that, and the IC50 seemed to work because these numbers for blood root, this was such a high concentration, and blood root kills cells really quick anyway, and so we're, the reason that not a lot is showing up there is because the cells are dead and floating and it's hard to get protein out of there and so the IC50 number doesn't kill cells as much and we were able to take protein and see if caspase had been cleaved. Okay, so we're wanting to do, like I said, we got MCF7 cells in so we're working with those this semester, and we're going to do all the same types of things with those. And we are also going to do colony formation assays because we've seen fenugreek was one of the, uh, Stephanie was working with fenugreek this summer, and we've had success with fenugreek and colony formation assays in the past, so we want to look at that. And here's, we're already working with NCF7 cells, and this is a bioluminescent assay that we got, and these are the extracts that have already been shown to kill cells, and it looks like they're killing cells with MCF7 cells, just like we saw with 4T1 cells. So we're excited about that, too. And I have a lot of people I want to thank because I had a lot of good help. And thank you all for listening. We have a few minutes for questions. I did tell my developmental biology class that if they asked a question that was good and relevant to this, that she could answer, they would only get two points of extra credit. But if they asked a really good one, she couldn't answer, they would get three. So, but I'm going, I'm going back on that. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. She'd be happy to answer. I know you don't have a question that she couldn't answer. I might have. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any questions? What level of ethanol did you end up using? What concentration? What concentration? Um, we always use one to a hundred as our concentration, and so, or we would actually we diluted cells at ten thousand micrograms per milliliter in ethanol. We diluted our extracts at ten thousand micrograms per mil. So that's what we. Within like you said, it was a it was a one microliters. There was two microliters of the ethanol treatment, so it was an under one hundred. Like our plant <laughs> extracts. So you show me the, ex the ethanol graph again.
is ethanol not killing things? When it's along the line of untreated. But we actually... Well, we're doing in here because we, our plant extracts were diluted at 10,000 micrograms per milliliter. And like our, we took those and the treatments at 1 to 100. So it was like 1 to 100 of a 10,000 microgram per milliliter concentration. But you still had 1 to 100 of ethanol. Why are your standard deviation bars so long? I thought some of them, it was like almost the entire length of the bar. Those might be errors of the pipetter or, um, <laughs> <laughs> like, we would do uh, triplicates for everything. Like, the 96 well plates, we would use three wells for each. Like, if we were doing fenugreek band one, then we would have three for that one. And so, if one number was off, then it's going to give you really high standard deviation. Like, one, of the, one of the biggest problems with that is go to the, the picture that shows the 96 well plate. Sometimes when you're adding a whole bunch of treatments, oh, did I add it to that one or did I, <laughs> have I, did I forget? So some of them, would, most of the numbers would be real tight, and then one number would be like nothing you added. So. So we usually do each of these assays several times and hopefully get some What is since it's like an all ginger like ginger it's an all natural solution to like killing cancer cells, what are the chances of like the body like becoming immune to it faster than it's supposed to like uh, a different drug or something? Immune to ginger? Um, I'm not really sure. Uh, I think that it's more like, I don't know what this would be like as an actual treatment like on humans. Right now we're just testing it on cells. I'm not sure that you would become immune to something like ginger. I really don't know. You're in developmental biology, you get an extra point. <laughs> <laughs> Um, probably keep working on it for a while. I don't know. Can you graduate? <laughs> May of 2013. <laughs> yes. What tendency is going to be your target server again? In curcumin? Is that what you're talking about? Thank you very much for coming. There are more refreshments over here, and if you haven't signed up in the front, go ahead and do that before you leave. Thank you.